Struggling with a failing economy, inadequate public services and the meddlesome attention of two rival regional powers, many Lebanese hoped recent elections might provoke reforms to help solve their problems. But in a country where power is apportioned along sectarian and dynastic lines, little ever seems to disturb the status quo. We went to find out why. In May 2018, Lebanon went to the polls. It was the first parliamentary election in nine years, and there was one question on many observers' minds. Was it to be politics as usual, or would growing concern over the country's myriad problems affect the outcome? There is at least a hint of change in the air. For the first time, a grassroots movement known as the Civil Society Coalition was fielding candidates against Lebanon's long-established sectarian parties. نحن مع بعضنا عم نخلق حركة سياسية جديدة لأنه نحن الدولة بكرة رح نربح عم ننزل بحماس إنه نحن عم نكتب تاريخ جديد للبنان وهذا شيء كتير 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 مهم. But apathy was the biggest winner. Voter turnout was less than 50 percent. Despite general disgust over spiraling unemployment and faltering basic services, it seemed few Lebanese believed the route to solutions lay through the ballot box. I didn't vote because the system won't change. Our assumption was that people were fed up after nine years of having the same parliament. People would go and vote. It seems that this was not the case. Are we at the point where people don't care anymore? In the aftermath of an election that promised much but delivered little to its six million citizens, we've been to investigate why Lebanon's distinctive political setup appears so dysfunctional and resistant to change. In 2015, Lebanon's capital, Beirut, saw the first of several demonstrations against huge mounds of uncollected garbage that were piling up in the city. Soon, the rallies were attracting over 100,000 people as fury grew over the state's failure. The authorities quashed the protests but in doing so gave birth to a movement that would later attempt to challenge the country's unique political system. As the most religiously diverse country in the Middle East, Lebanon has tried to prevent any one group from dominating by setting up a parliamentary system known as confessionalism in which each of the main sects holds a position in government. The president must be Maronite Christian, the prime minister Sunni Muslim, and the speaker of parliament Shiite Muslim. Lori Haithayan was a candidate for civil society in the elections. But being born Armenian Orthodox, she could only stand against others of that sect in her district. This is what we are trying to fight, that this is not sustainable a division. You are dividing people according to their religion or to their sect, and this is the only identity you are enforcing, while there should be citizens of this country with the same rights and responsibilities. Lori's district of Ashrafiye is one of Beirut's Christian heartlands, still influenced by the legacy of Bashir Ismail leader of the right-wing Qatar party during Lebanon's 15-year civil war, which ended in 1990. He was president-elect for three weeks before he was assassinated in 1982. Power being passed from father to son is a common feature in Lebanon's dynastic politics. Although he was only four months old when his father was killed, Nadim is a prominent member of the Kitaib party. You can call it inheritance, you can call it the easy way to do things, but what I believe is that I believe in the same cause. I have the same values and ethics of doing politics. 
Christians are part of the people of Lebanon, and of course we cannot, as Christians, live in Lebanon if we don't guarantee them the freedom and the security. Bashir Jmayet was the defender of the Christians during the civil war. And when we were doing our election campaign in this uh, region, people would say that uh, Ashrafiye without the Jmayel family is not Ashrafiye. That's why Nadim Jmayel has popularity here. They see him as the continuation of that political ideology. There is fear between all the community. Between the Sunnis and the Shia, there is fear. Between the Christian and the Muslim, there is fear. Between the Shia and the Christian, there is fear. All this is based on the fact that no one trusts the other community. The system guarantees government posts to all the main parties. But it can also mean politicians are both unaccountable and free to dispense patronage as they like. Our citizens were mistaken by voting to some people just because they, they offer services or money. I believe that the confessional system in Lebanon has um, destroyed all the equilibrium of power. Under confessionalism, if the government can't or won't provide state welfare, citizens are forced to turn to their sectarian leaders for help. It's how Lebanon has run for generations. Today, these people are all awaiting an audience with Taymour Jamblat, one of the main clan leaders of Lebanon's Druze community. It's a family tradition, usually. We always open the house Tuesdays to receive people, and usually they come either for financial assistance or jobs. And since we don't have a stable government that provides jobs, this is what we do. These people have come asking for financial help to cover medical bills and support with their children's tuition fees. An overwhelming number are here to find jobs. The Druze are an offshoot of Shia Islam. They may only constitute around 5% of the population, but in fighting hard for their say, they are still a force in Lebanese politics. Like Nadim Jmayil, Jumblat inherited his role as leader of the main Druze party from his father. He is unexpectedly candid about why. I don't want to be in politics, but I have to. I owe it to my father and to my family history, which who have been basically working in politics for more than 400 years. It's a family business. We don't want to cease to exist at some point. So we are, we're always fighting to stay in power. It's almost like a feudal system, and the community, they, they always come back to us for help or for assistance. Unfortunately, in Lebanon and Jews can go to the other camp, to a Sunni camp or a Christian camp to ask for help. He always comes back to his roots. Basically, every political party is responsible for his own people. It's just the way the country is built. Even myself and my father, we're all accountable, but nobody actually is going to admit to that. The odds are stacked against anyone not running on a confessional ticket getting into parliament. One of the few who managed it is billionaire Fouad Marzoumi. He's convinced the confessional system has done the country more harm than good. There is no equality in this country. Politics stinks, economy stinks, social conditions stinks. And add to it the dimension of sectarianism, forcing people to go for the sectarian leader to even get their basic rights. That combination force people to go for the allegiance for the individual, not for the state. As one of the richest men in Lebanon, Marzoumi could fund his campaign in ways groups like the Civil Society Coalition could not afford. The people that they had a cause, like the civil society, that they really believed that they have a message to send out, they couldn't even get it out. So unfortunately, here, it's not anymore the causes that you are fighting for. Political program is for lease. Politicians in Lebanon mostly are for lease. You don't buy them, they're too expensive. That ruling class did not want somebody to come in unless you can afford it. In my case, I can afford it. During elections, politicians often use local political agents known as election keys. These are individuals who mediate on behalf of candidates to secure votes. Tawfiq Nahas was one of Fuad Marzoumi's election keys. He reveals just how the system works. Some people used to give money 
And uh, as you know, most of the people are in need of money because of the present political situation. It starts from $100 per person. It reached to $1,500 per person to give his vote. People are in poor state. They came to us asking for money, but we told them that this is against the law. On the other hand, if you cannot pay for the rent, we can support you. But the most important thing, and we give it priority, is medical assistance. We were very, very, very busy. Tawfiq Nahas told us he'd met over a thousand people asking for help. The Mahzoumi Foundation claims to have been supporting families long before the elections, including running soup kitchens. But his charity certainly didn't hurt his candidacy. Equally, many voters are just as willing to take advantage, offering their loyalty to whichever party will help them. Critics say Lebanon's distinctive constitution inevitably lends itself to abuse and is the main reason why the country is often cited as one of the most corrupt in the Middle East. It's almost acceptable now that we always blame the politicians, but my father says it's a, it's a vicious circle. It takes two to tango. I mean, the politicians are being voted by the people, so... There's certainly much wealth on show here, albeit for the select few who are able to make the political system work to their advantage. These impressive new skyscrapers are a good example. A staggering 80% of Lebanon's coast has been privatized, but activists say much of this development is illegal. Civil society campaigner Nahida Khalil takes us on a boat trip to explain why. One of the most controversial developments is this resort. It opened recently despite several legal rulings against it. Eden Bay Resort Haide, La Echadam Natanzim El Modunil, Hatta Matan Rasaya Aslan Kilayeta Galat. In Rahan Rais Jumuri, you've been Hakan Hal Maudu, Rais Jumuri, Butlub, Men Rais Nakabet Mohandisin, Bilbnain, Killa, and Nuyati Rayu. Biatu Rayu, Nubulu Haidam Halafu Haida, Mabit Sarahlu Abadan Haida Lezimitabba, Umabi and Amal Shib. The resort is just one of many enterprises spreading along the coast. Nahida tells us that to add insult to injury, the resorts and restaurants routinely pump their waste into the sea. As the 2015 garbage crisis showed, Lebanon's problem with waste management is not new. But endemic corruption and gridlock over which party has responsibility meant it remains a highly sensitive political issue. Here on the shoreline, it's fishermen like Najib el who are most affected. He tells us he now struggles to earn a living from these contaminated waters. <laughs> Najib and Nahida take us to a stretch of coast where it seems there's almost as much plastic as sand. Inevitably, anger is boiling over. 
To send a message to the government, the fishermen hold a protest at one of the new coastal landfill sites. These were the government's response to the rubbish crisis. But the fishing community says that toxins leaking into the sea are now poisoning the water. The police try to limit the protest. But the presence of the only civil society candidate to win a seat in the recent elections and the only parliamentarian to turn up gives them pause. Today, they're asking for their right uh, to fish, at least. But instead of fishing, all they're getting is garbage from the sea. In Lebanon, no one is responsible. They sit all of them in the government on the same table, and every time we point to the other. He is responsible, not me. I would blame every minister in this government, and I would blame uh, the president, because they run the country. Yet the question of who actually runs the country is open to dispute and subject to geopolitics. Lebanon's position between more powerful neighbors has always made it vulnerable to outside influences. You have Israel on the one side, you have Syria with its civil war on the other. You have Saudi and Iran fighting proxy wars all over the Middle East. You have Turkey in the north of Iraq also fighting the Kurds. You have the US and Russia fighting for a piece of the pie. So it's a miracle that we still exist. Today, the dominant external players in the country are Iran, which supports the Shia Muslim party Hezbollah and its allies, and Saudi Arabia, which supports most Sunnis and certain Christian parties against Hezbollah. Things came to a head in November 2017, when Prime Minister Saad al-Hariri was visiting Saudi Arabia, and to the shock of his fellow citizens, suddenly appeared on TV to make a statement. Many in Lebanon believe that Hadidi was held hostage by his Saudi patrons and forced to resign because he was losing ground to Hezbollah. After international pressure, Hadidi returned home and said he wasn't giving up office after all. But he has yet to explain exactly what took place. We don't know what happened there. The president announced that our prime minister was a prisoner in Saudi Arabia. Then the prime minister came back after a month. He said that, OK, I'm not resigning anymore. And then business as usual. <laughs> What's that? This is, this, it's, it's not normal. The people who are in charge of the country are not in charge of the country. They are protecting Iran or Saudi Arabia by sitting there in the parliament where they, they are supposed to legislate. Distorted politics. We tried repeatedly to get an interview with the prime minister for this film, but our requests were declined. His opponents too have their patrons, and the leader of the Hezbollah party, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, does not shy away from his reliance on Iran. Hezbollah and its allies, including the President Michel Aoun's party, were the biggest winners in the recent elections. We tried to speak with Hezbollah's leadership, but were told that they too were not giving interviews. Even filming from a car in a Hezbollah-controlled area is problematic. 
Security is tight and outsiders are quickly spotted. Enmity to Israel is one of Hezbollah's defining characteristics. The party did agree to show us their museum in Mlita, close to the border with Israel. Built on a former battleground, the place is a showpiece of Hezbollah's resistance to Israeli attacks. We are here in uh, Sujud Bunker, uh, used by fighters of resistance during the war in 1980s and 1990s. هاي الأسلحة اللي عم نشوفها هي طبعاً غنائم حرب ومعارك مختلفة من قبل المقاومين اللي في حزب الله وأثناء الصراع مع العدو الإسرائيلي. Iranian funds, we're told, gave Hezbollah the means to fight Israel more effectively than the less equipped Lebanese army. It's why, for years now, proposals that Hezbollah's paramilitary wing should give up its weapons have divided both the government and public opinion. For its supporters, Hezbollah is seen primarily as a resistance movement. You don't want to the Lebanon with the weapons. And you also want to take the weapons of the weapons. And the Lord said to the weapons of the weapons is red. But the existence of a separate armed force under one political party worries many in Lebanon. If Hezbollah has missiles uh, that can defend Lebanon, why should they stay with Hezbollah? Why not transfer these arms into the Lebanese army? Joseph Malouf is handing over office today and leaving the political world where he has served for the last nine years as a parliamentarian for the Lebanese forces, a right-wing Christian party which gained in the elections. The aspirations of Iran to set up the Shiite crescent from Iran to Iraq to Syria to Lebanon is obvious. Hezbollah is a threat to the democratic system and the economy of this country. This country cannot sustain if Hezbollah maintains what they're doing. They've had their impact directly and indirectly, especially on the economy of Lebanon and the proper governance of the system. I don't feel personally threatened by Hezbollah. That's for sure. But I know that my country is threatened by their presence. Unsurprisingly, Hezbollah refutes such claims. In the absence of effective state welfare, Hezbollah, like most other political parties, offers services to its supporters, including providing food for the poor. Joseph Malouf begs to differ. I don't think Saudi Arabia has ever armed anybody in Lebanon, with all due respect. The Lebanese expats that work in the Middle East, in general, in the Gulf in particular, bring into this the economy, the local economy, close to six billion dollars a year. Honestly, I don't know what contribution to my economy Iran has done. Given Hezbollah's recent election successes, it may look like Iran is winning the proxy war against Saudi Arabia. Yet the history of Lebanon is all about no one side ever becoming dominant. In the situation where we are living, it's always going to be this balance between these uh, different agendas, because whenever you have one prevailing over the other, you have civil war. But maintaining this delicate equilibrium through Lebanon's confessionalist system has long been seen here as both a blessing and curse. It's about identity. It's always been about identity in Lebanon. I mean, you still have 19 religious communities. You don't have one Lebanon, you have 19 Lebanons. You don't have one vision for the future, you have 19 of them. While the power sharing that's embodied in the current constitution 
might have kept these different visions alive, or at least prevented Lebanon from returning to the dark days of sectarian conflict, its critics say it's also led to stagnation, clientelism and corruption at the hand of an entrenched elite. The government is stuck in gridlock, the economy struggles and mismanaged public services fail to deliver. Few places epitomize the stagnation better than the country's once proud railway system, which used to connect three continents. Lebanon's trains stopped running during the civil war more than 40 years ago. Inter-party squabbles over responsibility and budget have stopped them moving ever since. Although ludicrously, this rusting network is still officially in receipt of public funds, in reality, it's now just a relic of better times. A victim, like so much in Lebanon, of a system that does little more than keep rivals apart and political dynasties in place.